Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Landlord, Tenant and COVID-19 webinar. My name is Chris Arola. I'm president of the Rental Owners Association and today I'm joined by real estate attorney Gary Link. Uh, I'll make a note that today is um, April 21st, 2020 and I make that note because the information we're giving out today is the latest information that we have. However, you should understand that this information is changing um, almost regularly, almost daily, I should say. It's changing regularly, almost daily, certainly weekly. We have a couple of other industry uh, legislative bills that are being looked at very carefully that could could change even what we're saying today um, extensively. So, um, Gary, can you hear me okay? I can hear you well, Chris. Hi. You're alive, sir. Oh, so, yeah. Tell me how long you've been a real estate attorney here in the local Sacramento area. I think many, many people out here already know you. And uh, how long have you been practicing real estate uh, law? Since, since 1979. So that's, uh, we've really? just celebrated a little bit over 40 years. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. So you have thousands of evictions and thousands of uh, litigation, real estate litigation cases under your belt. And yeah, so when it comes to, Knowing the answers, you're the man. Um, I, hope so. I will also say this to our listeners and um, people observing this webinar. If you do have a question, you can ask that question down at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand side. You can click on that and simply ask a question. You can also go to the Say Hello uh, screen down at the lower right, and you can uh, chat give you throw out an opinion say anything talk to each other um, because we're going to cover some information that um, maybe sometimes there's not a real clear uh, answer or solution on how to proceed so Gary um, as I said this webinar is not meant to provide legal advice every situation is different um, anything that's said here has to be uh, taken in the spirit of you need to understand what we're discussing and then probably get some professional advice to apply uh, these rules to your specific situation. Either advice from Gary or perhaps an industry um, organization such as the Rental Owners Association. And, and even then, we're referring uh, back and forth with our attorneys on a regular basis. So Gary, let's start from the beginning here. Back in March, March 16th, 2020, we had our first executive order issued by Governor Newsom, uh, N 2820, and this is before, as we were starting to become aware of this pandemic. And tell me what that um, executive order did. So, in short, what it did, it authorized local jurisdictions, cities, counties to enact their own bits of ordinances, statutes, legislation that dealt with predominantly from our perspective, eviction moratoriums. Whether or not a three-day notice could be given, a notice to vacate could be given, uh, the governor left that authority to the cities and counties to promulgate whatever they would choose to do. That's the essence of it. Uh, so let's go back. Prior to, six, prior to March 16th, we had state law that prevailed, told us what to do when a tenant, for example, didn't pay rent. Now the governor is saying on the 16th, he would leave it up to local jurisdictions to determine how they wanted landlords to handle that situation. Is that a good interpretation? A good. Uh, it's a good interpretation. It says here in, in the executive order, and this is N2820, it says, any provision of state law that would preempt or otherwise restrict a local government's exercise of its police power to impose substantive limitations on residential and commercial evictions uh, is suspended to the extent it would preempt or otherwise restrict such exercise. And then it talked about, it says this paragraph two of Executive Order 2820 shall apply, only apply to the imposition of limitations on evictions when, and then it described what those circumstances would be. And it's pretty brief. I can read it sure. for the listeners. It says the basis for the eviction is non-payment of rent or okay. a foreclosure arising out of a substantial decrease in household or business income, including but not limited to a substantial decrease in household income 
caused by layoffs or a reduction in the number of compensable hours of work or a substantial decrease in business income caused by a reduction in opening hours or consumer demand or substantial out-of-pocket medical expenses and the decrease in household or business income or out-of-pocket medical expenses described that I just read was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic or by any local, state, or federal occupation thereof. Okay. Then it goes on. And it says okay. the protections, <clears throat> if you've heard that, the protections are going to be in effect through May 31st of 2020. So okay. currently, because today's April 21st, these protections still exist now till May 31st. Those are 10 days. So to to put that in, and I, I'm a layman at this. I'm a pro property manager for 30 years, but when it comes to this, um, I leave it up to you guys. So you have to explain it to me. So what, what this says to me is that um, if I have a property in Sacramento City, for example, and my tenant doesn't pay rent because they're affected by uh, one of the reasons that you mentioned, they're in, in one of those groups. The city could pass an ordinance that says, Chris, you can't, you cannot file an eviction. You can't do anything. Technically, they could do that. The city has the power. That's what that first executive order did, is gave the power to the local jurisdictions to decide how I, a landlord, can handle the situation. Even if it, and if it supersedes the state, the current state laws. In terms of, I know I'm it saying supplements, it supplements the current state laws and allows the opportunity for the local jurisdictions to make their own ordinances, resolutions, their rules. own rules, subject to the guidelines. Subject to the now guidelines. We, know that we now know that the city has done that, the county has done that, the jurisdictions around here have done that, um, and they're all a little bit different. The city is different than the county's resolution and ordinance. Woodland has one, Davis has one, different in different places. So to be clear, so, and, and more, go ahead. Chris, yeah. more, when you take a look at N2820, that executive order was also changed and altered to the extent of what's called N3720. Right. So N3720 is the latest update to that executive order, which gives some parameters that by and large for the city and the county have been followed uh, with regard to what are called covered reasons for non-payment and certain moratoriums and limitations on that. Okay. So before we go any further, you know, I, I, I'm a landlord and, and property manager, and I don't want to give the impression that I or my clients are not empathetic to anyone who's affected by uh, COVID and all, any of our tenants. In fact, most of my clients are are calling. They want to help. They want to make arrangements. They want to um, they want to work with their tenants for the greater good and get out of this and everybody be whole at some point in future. What makes us nervous is when we see, for example, um, state giving control to local ordinance in local jurisdictions and we don't know what those rules are and as some of those rules start to come forward we see that they are doing things like prohibiting us from in, in a roundabout way from being able to collect our rent and, and and for most of my clients that means they can't pay their living expenses and that sort of thing so that's where they start to get a little nervous so First executive order, March 16th, 2020, and it sounds like the second executive order, which there are two things happened on the 27th. One, the second executive order, which you previously mentioned, 3720, which would you call that a clarification or extension of, of, of N 2820, the first both. order? It's both. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that, Not that clarifies... The time frame still remains the same. The protections are going are gonna to be in effect still through May 31st of 2020. So like you said, another 10 days or so at least. Yeah. And so that clarifies who's no. covered, what situations are covered. Hold on a minute. Okay. This is still the month of April. You said 10 days. We still have, this is through May 31st. We're in April. So it's oh, not. Oh, oh. 
Let me get my calendar out here. All right. Thank you. I already got an ice cream headache from all this, Gary. I can hardly, I mean, whoo. Okay. We got another 40 days. We got another 40 days roughly to deal with this. And, and then we'll probably look at an extension if things aren't curing up, clearing up by then. We'll see. We'll see. So second executive order um, clarifies those covered reasons uh, that you read out of the first executive order. And also on March 27th, we had the CARES Act uh, passed by our United States Congress. So that's a before national. We, before we get to the CARES Act, can I, can I make reference to N3720? Absolutely, yes. I think that's vital. It's very important here. So there are two different kinds of coverages. You mentioned the Federal CARES Act and particularly section 4024 predominantly is applying to most of us in 22 and 23. Um, but with regard to the executive order, that's there are covered properties and covered reasons. So the CARES Act talks about covered properties. Okay. The executive order, and for instance, we mentioned the city and the county, we're talking about covered reasons for not paying that are impacted because of COVID-19. Okay. All right. So I that's really focused on the people. discussion of the federal law for a second. And that if really I focuses think. on people who, uh, on tenants who are directly affected by COVID and can't pay the rent and need some, need some workable solution. And, and so that, that's, I get it. It's covered reasons covered situations so under, under the, the executive order under the executive order it talks about the tenant notifying the landlord in writing before the rent is due or within a reasonable time period afterward not to exceed seven days that the tenant needs to delay all or some of the rent payment due to an inability to pay the full amount due because of reasons that are related to COVID-19 now the time we have on this webinar doesn't really allow us me the opportunity to read those, but there are very substantial reasons listed there, which right. are pretty much mirrored in the city and the county and other jurisdictions. So the tenants got to give notification. The city and the county say before the date the rent's due, but the executive order gives an expanded period of time and with a conservative approach, right. seven days beyond, um, the day before it's due. So typically rents due in advance on or before the first day of the month, the tenant gets seven more days. And then they're supposed to provide documentation. But in the city and the county, the documentation date isn't specifically defined. The city says as soon as possible, but the executive order says the documentation may be provided to the landlord no later than the time upon payment of back due rent. Okay. And the city and the county ordinance talk about 120 days after the termination of the uh, emergency order. Okay. Again, and days after May and let's freeze on that for a minute. We'll come back to that because I want to talk about the teeth of, of, of serving notices and, and that we've already had that discussion privately. We'll do that in a minute. But let's continue on and talk about the CARES Act that was passed by the Congress, Federal Congress, on um, on March 27th. Before we do that, I have some notes up here. I don't. It looks like I have a couple of questions and some notes. One, Jan Griggs. I agree with you, Jan. It says, "Good thing we have Gary." Hello, Jan. Thank God, thank God for Gary. And then Good we have. Yeah, they, they can hear us. Um, and then another question here, um, which I'm going to hold off, and, and we'll get to that in a second. Let me just make sure. Can you please address the eviction restrictions on commercial tenants? Um, and I'm going to say before we answer that, uh, Gary, do you want to address commercial tenancies at all? Very, very quickly. Uh, with regard, okay. for instance, in the city of Sacramento, they amended the ordinance to include pretty much the same parameters for commercial tenancies as with residential tenancies. In the resolution in the county of Sacramento, as well as the ordinance that came from the resolution, it does not include commercial tenancies. For the Federal CARES Act, for the purpose of our conversation today, it doesn't deal with the commercial tenancies. It deals with the residential dwellings as a covered property, possibly covered property. Yeah. And so, so it goes back to knowing where your property is located, looking up those um, ordinances, because 
as I go to the, for example, the CAA site, and also on our site, we have the ordinances at uh, the uh, Rental Owners Association. If you go to calandlord.org <clears throat> or CaliforniaLandlord.org, sorry, um, you'll be able to look up uh, at least if your property is local and see what ordinances are, per, pertain to you. Um, so. Yeah, commercial, a, a lot of the things I've read, commercial seems to be mirroring uh, residential. That's mostly what I've seen. And I have commercial property too, and some of those tenants haven't paid. And so I'm dealing with it pretty much like a residential if I can't find any information on it. Um, all right, the CARES Act, Gary, what is that? What did that do on the same day as the, as the second executive order, um, March 27th? So so President Trump signed it on March 27th, and it's if you look it up on the internet, it's like 800 pages long. Right. But our particular interest is focused on right now section 4022, 4023, and 4024, and mostly 4024. And it talks about if the property is a covered property. Now that's distinct from being a covered reason for delay or non-payment of rent. If it's a if it's a covered property, there are protections uh, that are available to the tenant because it's a covered property. Okay, do we have that down? Covered reason, covered property. So this is now, talking about a covered property. property. Okay, it what's a covered it property? Means, it means. Any property that participates in a covered housing program as defined in a certain section, you'd have to read it, the Rural Housing Voucher Program, federally backed mortgage loans, or federally backed multifamily loans. Now that's mortgage loans. So now hold on right the there. Let me jump in real quick. We've had calls from clients who, and we've even called clients saying, how do I find out if I have a federally backed mortgage? I mean, that's not something that everybody knows. And the answer is um, you can, if you have all your information from when you purchase the home, you, you'll have, you'll see right there what kind of loan you have, how it's backed, or you can contact the title company and for about $50, they'll do some research and tell you if you have a mortgage that's backed by a federal uh, but if, if you have a federally backed mortgage, that is by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, I'm going to tell you most most loans are federally backed mortgages, unless you've got a portfolio loan or something like that. But uh, for the most part, I'm going to assume that most of my clients, for example, are their loans are federally backed loans, so they fall into this covered property. Covered category. property. Covered property now, category. There's a consequence for the property being covered. Here's the consequence. There's an eviction filing moratorium where it says that during the 120 days beginning on the date of the enactment of the act, which was March 27th, the lessor of a covered dwelling may not make or cause to be made any filing with the court of jurisdiction to initiate a legal action to recover possession of the covered dwelling from the tenant for non-payment of rent or other fees or charges. Now, okay. that's the filing of a lawsuit. It so that's the filing. Is, that's actually filing down at the courthouse. That's what's being that's prohibited it. there. That's how okay. I've interpreted it. It doesn't okay. preclude, although some have said this, my current some have said otherwise, but my current interpretation of this is subject to local ordinances and the executive orders and the covered reason for delayed payment issues, that this CARES Act does not preclude the proper issuance of a three-day notice to pay rent or quit, okay. but it does limit the time frame when the lawsuit can be filed. So the CARES Act does not prohibit a landlord giving a three-day notice to pay rent or quit to a tenant for non-payment of rent. The CARES Act does not prohibit that, but let's be clear, as we were discussing earlier, a local ordinance may prevent a landlord from doing that because yeah. of the first executive order issued by the governor in 2820 and the clarification. So how is a landlord gonna know? Well, 
again, if your if your property is locally in the Sac Greater Sacramento area, uh, you can contact Gary, and you see his information on our most right hand screen over there. At least on me, it's a right hand. Uh, you see Gary's information. You can email him, and uh, or call him, or you can go to our website at uh, uh, CaliforniaLandlord.org. And, um, and that takes you to the Rental Owners Association. You can look and look up your ordinance. You can read it. And then you can call Gary to figure out what it means. Because believe me, they're not all as clear cut as we would like them uh, to be. So the CARES Act, let's go back to that. It, it defines covered properties. Among other things, a covered property is a property that's financed by a federally backed loan. And there's a whole host of other criteria that can make a property a covered property and to know if it is you're going to have to read you're going to have to read the bill yes or, ta or talk to you check, check with your lender check with, with your the lender, lender right, right. Uh, on the on the on the federal on the financing part but okay and then april 6th came along are we ready to go to april 6th well i, I also want to add one more thing on this moratorium it says that you cannot if it's a covered dwelling that the landlord cannot charge fees, penalties, or other charges to the right. tenant that, that are related to such non-payment of rent. So, so what we've got is we, we've got the federal law that we need to deal with under the CARES Act if it's a covered property. Then we have the executive order throughout the state of California, actually the two, N2820 and N3720, that have to be considered as well when the person comes along and says before the due date or with the, within the seven days before the due date, right. so by the seven, they say that they have a COVID related reason for non-payment or delay payment. We got to consider that. And then we have another tier where we have to consider um, the local ordinances as well. All that's part of the consideration process as we trickle right. down. And now your question, was. Now I'm moving forward to April 6th, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the California Judicial Council handed down an, an emergency rule that bans nearly all evictions in California. Can you expand on that? Well, what it basically says is... Um, that for a period that the rule, it's called emergency rule number one, right. and it says this rule will remain in effect until 90 days after the governor declares that the state of emergency related to COVID-19 pandemic is lifted or until amended or repealed by the Judicial Council. So currently what we know is that goes till May 31st. It right. could be expanded. And so what it says it right there at the first of it. It says, notwithstanding any other law, including the applicable code sections dealing with unlawful detainers, this rule applies to all actions for unlawful detainer. That means with regard to the filing of a lawsuit for unlawful detainer based on a three-day pay rent or quit, a three-day performed company to quit, a three-day quit, a 30-day, a 60-day, a 90-day, a notice of non-renewal, an expiration of a lease, a tenant's notice, a mutual agreement for uh, to vacate all these different reasons that would otherwise have allowed us to file the eviction lawsuit. It says that a court may not issue a summons on a complaint for unlawful detainer during this time period, unless the court finds in its discretion and on the record that the action is necessary to protect public health and safety. So what it does is it puts this lock down or, or a barrier on not the filing of a lawsuit, a complaint for unlawful detainer, but on the issuance of the summons, which is the document that says to the tenant, defendant, you typically have five days within which to file a response. So you could, if the courts were open and the courts are closed in Sacramento right now under our presiding judge, Russell Hom's uh, court order till May 15th. So even if you could go in there and rush in on the 16th and file that lawsuit subject to all the other limitations, the court wouldn't be able to issue you a summons based on the judicial council order where you wouldn't be able to go to the tenant and say you have five days to respond because that is all delayed until 90 days at least after May 31st. 
Okay, so let's go through the math just real quick. 90 days, so May 31st, let's say the emergency order is lifted, and June 1st, now we can fight, well, the clock starts. So that takes me June, July, August. That's 90 days. So right. I get the file end of August in September 1, say, which I suppose the courts are going to be a little backed up, I'm going to guess. So let's say we file sep September 1, September, October, somewhere around October and November, maybe September, late September. I'm, I'm guessing, is there any way for a landlord to get themselves in line uh, in, the, in the queue? Yeah. You know, it's been a conversation about getting in line and getting in the queue, and it's kind of a pragmatic, practical issue for each landlord and property manager. You know, you, it, even if you could serve appropriately a three-day notice to pay or quit or a 30 or a 60, you're going to be limited on actually moving forward with the lawsuit, even if you filed it. And here's, here's one of my concerns. Um, I know other attorneys, some attorneys have said, well, file that lawsuit, get it in right. line, get it in the queue. But here's what's going to happen. Let's say for the month of April unless or May. Let's make it May. Sure. Uh, May 31st. Yeah, May 31st. You file the eviction lawsuit if you can. Okay. You're going to pay a filing fee, $240. You're going to pay the attorney the cost to do it. But you can't move forward on the lawsuit. Are you with me? Yeah. What if the tenant vacates the property before the summons is able to first be issued? There's going to be a lot more money expended, a lot more time, a lot more hassle, a lot of inconvenience, which everybody's got to weigh on whether or not you want to move forward or not. Exactly. I've got one one uh, client who said um, just recently, well, if I let's talk about a three-day pay or quit. If I can serve a three-day pay or quit, I want to serve that three-day pay or quit. If I can file a lawsuit, I want to file the lawsuit on the first available day. Right. I understand the exigencies um, because if you never served the three-day pay or quit, what would you do? Send a letter, make a phone call. You could send a letter. I know the Apartment Association has crafted a, uh, a letter that uh, folks can take a look at. Others have crafted letters as well yeah. saying, hey, we've got a <clears throat> The thing I would caution about letters is I've seen some letters that landlords have written to tenants and and they tend to be highly emotionally charged, sometimes threatening, that sort of thing. So if you want to write a letter to your tenant, well, let me back up. You, you said if, you use the word if, you're able to serve a three-day notice. If you're not able to serve a three-day notice due to an ordinance where your property is located, the local jurisdiction where your property is located, then perhaps you could send a letter. I haven't seen anything that would preclude you from doing that. Um, it should be an empathetic, a nice letter something to the effect you stated it well earlier, Gary, um, and maybe we'll put something up on our site. Um, basically, you, you're, if you're affected by COVID, um, if you're not affected by COVID-19, your rent is due, please send payment. Thank you very much. That's about, about all you can do. Um, so that now, leads us to- I, I, I got to clarify something too. Yeah. Too. What we're talking about when we say serve a notice, I mean, particularly we're talking about a three-day pay or quit notice right. for the rent. These ordinances that we've talked about, not the Tenant Protection Act, not the AB 1482 application type issues, right. but those are typically dealing with non-payment of rent. There are other kind of notices, perform covenants or quit, right? for instance, violation of the no assignment, subletting, too many people living there, the barbecue on the balcony, the pet without permission, other violations of the rental agreement. Mm -hmm. which have nothing to do with the payment of rent or utilities or fees or other charges if it's a covered property. So th those are care. also so, in so other notices are available to be served. Letters, good cause warning notices, reminder mm -hmm. letters. But again, it all trickles down to what jurisdiction and when and where we can file the lawsuits. And I have talked to landlords who've had results from sending those nice letters, who've had tenants then get in contact with them. And if they want to do something like Gary, like that, Gary, um, they should probably contact you to help craft something or help them do that. And you can see your phone number over there, 447-8101, or Gary at Team Link, I believe. 
Is that your email? At what's your email address? So, uh, Gary team Link at teamlink.com. Gary team Link at teamlink.com. Okay. We, and that's on my website as well on the Rental Owners Association. Go to CaliforniaLandlord.org, look at our industry partners, and you'll see Gary's smiling face right there. Okay, so let's then get to this question because we had um, AJ ask a question that really cut to the chase of all of this, but I really wanted to give some background before we answered it. Uh, J AJ says, I'm a landlord on a single fam with, with a single... I'm a landlord with a single family residence for rent. I have a mortgage payment on this property, insurance and taxes that I am paying on a monthly basis. What options do I have as a landlord since my tenant cannot pay rent? What does my tenant have to provide to the property management company managing my property and what can I do? So that really is, everybody's looking for that bottom line, Gary. Why don't you summarize kind of what we just talked about it? And I know it starts with, it depends. Yeah, it all depends on where the property is located. Yeah. What city, what county. But for the purpose of discussion of the eviction moratorium and three-day notices and so forth, the tenant is to get a covered reason for non-payment opportunity. Under the Executive Order 3720, the tenant is supposed to, in writing, before the date the rent is due, which would arguably be the last day of the month, and a period not to exceed seven days, notify the landlord that there is a covered reason for delay or non-payment. Documentation can be provided way in the future, according to the executive order, and the tenant is supposed to, but it's not being enforced, and I'm hearing so many people say the tenants are just ignoring the issue of having an opportunity to pay a portion of the rent or part of the rent. They're just ignoring it. But that just deals with the moratorium in terms of time. Right. So what does a tenant really need to do? If the tenant has a COVID-19 reason, a covered reason for delayed or non-payment, they need to notify the landlord. Now, the city of Sacramento has some guidance in their supplemental paperwork, which identifies that for each individual month that the tenants got to do that, you know, upcoming months, for instance, for the month of May and the month of June. But I don't see that guidance in using an example, Sacramento County. So AJ, um, also to the, the notice that Gary's talking about, I have a notice in my management company um, that we sent to um, we send to tenants when they contact us and say, "Hey, I have COVID nineteen, or I got laid off because of COVID nineteen, or someone in my family." One of those reasons it qualifies. We have a form that we send out to them, which essentially they they complete and it asks them their name, their reason, um, if they can pay any rent. Um, I forget what questions are on there. That form is on my site. I do have that available. Um, it's free. Um, you can download it, use it. Um, adapt it if you need to. Um, it's all there at uh, CaliforniaLandlord.org. The Rental Owners Association uh, website has that. And then um, if it goes beyond that, you're going to want to contact Gary at 447-8101 and have a discussion with him. Um, Gary, we have another question, and and that is this. I, I know you're running on late on time. We've been here about a half hour, um, but the questions are starting to roll in and maybe we can help some of these folks out. It says, um, does the eviction moratorium, does the eviction mor moratorium apply to tenancy at will tenants? Are there any exceptions on eviction moratoriums for tenants who pose a safety issue to other tenants? And let me give a partial answer and then I'd like you to expand. We just discussed there, there is a, there are, exceptions you you may be able to perform an eviction if there's a uh, the tenant posing a safety issue to other tenants for example but gary how would you go about doing that how would you go about proving that are the courts even open um and able to take a case like that so the court oh geez that's so the cares act doesn't apply to let's say a violent tenant, a tenant disturbing the peace, creating a nuisance, we take the federal issue off the table. The next question is gonna be, we still need to comply with Assembly Bill 1482, which is the Tenant Protection Act for the state of California, just cause evictions. 
we have to make a determination of, or if it's if there's a local jurisdiction like the city, they have their own limitations. There might be the need to give a notice to cease first, then a three-day performed covenant or quit, then maybe a three-day quit after that. It all applies depending upon where the property is located. And then that's just with regard to the issue of giving of the notice. After that, we still have to worry about the judicial counsel order for the time frame and so forth. Now, it, there is some language in the ex emergency rule that talks about unless a court finds in its discretion and on the record the action is necessary for public health and safety. I haven't been confronted with one of those yet. Uh, my understanding is that the courts, there's nobody over there staffing these issues, even now. So some people have sought to get uh, stay away orders and restraining orders independently of the unlawful detainer realm, but I haven't had occasion to uh, be exposed to that kind of a concern yet. And I mean, if you did, the practicality of getting to court and doing some kind of a, a video hearing, I suppose, and, and then are you going to have to bring witnesses in to, to substantiate your claims? That there's, I mean, this is a tough situation for uh, what I'm going to call uh, conducting a, a real bona fide justifiable eviction, which... Again, that's some of the frustration for landlords is that, look, not all evictions uh, that are happening are based on non-payment of rent. Oftentimes it is a serious violation or breach of the lease agreement, oftentimes affecting other people like neighbors and, and, uh, and roommates and such. And the ordinance just kind of puts this blanket over everything that makes it a, a, one right. for everything, which so Under the Judicial Council order, with the exception that I just mentioned for the public health and safety. You know, if you, if it was a three day quit, a three day perform, a 30 day and notice of non-renewal other, and if it was all otherwise in compliance with the Assembly Bill 1482, located at Civil, Civil Code Section 1946.2, um, you'd still have to wait until the courts the court reopens for the issuance of the summons. Right. right. With the court open and the complaint is filed, the summons subject to the hearing process, maybe. And and again, we haven't I haven't had occasion to deal with that yet. Uh, you'd still have to wait. That's part of the problem. Right. From a landlord perspective. <clears throat> Question, anything on commercial tenants having the ability not to pay rent? We only kind of discussed that. Um, for the most part, you're going to want to look at uh, where your property is located, see if there's any special ordinances for commercial property. Gary, you mentioned downtown Sacramento, or city of Sacramento. Uh, commercial is roughly being treated the same as residential. The same rules apply, but that could vary from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Is that correct? For the, mor for the moratorium aspect of things. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, a question, is rent just suspended or forgiven? If suspended, when is it due, due to be repaid? What happens when the tenant cannot pay back all the rent? Well, um, that's what we that's kind of what we've been discussing here. And, and, and hopefully um, if you haven't had a chance to see the whole webinar, please go to our site. We will download it there and, um, and go over everything. You can watch it multiple times, but in effect, no, nothing has been forgiven. The state has not oh, issued any, any forgiveness of rent. That is a fallacy that I've heard numerous times. Um, rent is not even suspended. However, it may be, um, that that you as the landlord need to make some considerations uh, to a tenant if your property is a covered property or if the tenant has a covered reason. And for that, you're going to want to review this webinar. Go to our website, CaliforniaLandlord.org. Um, look at where your property is located, download the ordinance, read it, and then probably give a consult with Gary. Gary, you do phone consultations? We have been. Okay. A lot, a lot of shelter in place. Of course, I'm at home right now. So. Right, right. So if, if somebody wants to has a question for you, tell me what that would look like. They would contact you. Is there a fee? Is there a how does that work? The, there... uh, what they would do is they would send an email to okay. identify that they have a question. Uh, either myself uh, or my office manager would be sending an email to them back 
uh, setting up a retainer agreement. My hourly rate is $300 an hour okay. as we talk about the issues. Very reasonable. Um, I think it is. Uh, yeah. And then we go over the facts and the details and we email the documents and the papers. I do want to make a comment going back, so thanks for the opportunity to say that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chris. But in terms of the time payment, it says, if you look at Section 4, for instance, of the City of Sacramento, it says tenants who are afforded eviction protection under the particular section for the covered reason for delayed payment shall have up to 120 days after the expiration of the governor's right. executive order, including extensions, and he may extend it, to pay their landlord unpaid rent and related fees. During the 120-day period, the protections against evictions found in Section 2 of the ordinance apply for such tenants. So the question was, is it going to be forgiven? No, but there's going to be a lot of money due down the road, and they'll have a length of time within which to pay it. And, you know, I was on the site looking at all the ordinances that passed by these various cities. And, you know, that was the one thing that was the biggest variant, as I noticed. You know, one city would say the tenant has 120 days. The next city would say they have 60 days. The next one would say, uh, I think one of them was a year. Um, and so you need to look at your ordinance and see what those particular rules are because the governor uh, gave – power to those local jurisdictions to set up their own rules in that aspect. Um, penalties, Gary, we didn't talk much about penalties. Let's say somebody goofs. Um, landlord issues a three-day notice to pay rent or quit and uh, doesn't realize that the tenant or the property is covered under the CARES Act, uh, be it for the property or the tenant uh, has a covered reason via, um, as per the executive orders. Now they goofed, tenant gets an attorney, says, hey, what, you violated my rights? Um, they go. To, they call the DA, what, what kind of a, do you know much it, about the penalties? Has that been depends. laid out yet? It all depends, and sometimes it's laid out, and sometimes it isn't. Under the Federal yeah. CARES Act, I haven't seen any particular penalty, and I haven't read any narration or commentary about a particular penalty, but it'll probably be available as what's called an affirmative defense where a tenant would go into court with or without an attorney and, or the judge would look at it on his or her own and go, well, look, did you give this notice? Is it a covered property? Have you met the requirements of what are called the cause of action to be able to establish the claim for unlawful detainer? Yeah. That would be under the federal act. And earlier when you uh, asked me the question about other penalties, I looked at uh, this, one of the supplement sheets, for instance, for the city, of Sacramento and it says um, a tenant may use this ordinance as an affirmative defense in an unlawful detainer or other action brought by the landlord to recover possession of the rental unit UD case a landlord who violates this eviction prohibition is subject to administrative penalties up to twenty five thousand dollars pursuant to chapter 1.2 of the Sacramento City Code um, I believe as I read some of the other jurisdictional ordinances, there are penalties that are similar, if not the same, for violations. So, you know, we're, we're all doing our best in good faith, I think, I know I am, in good faith to review all the elements, to comply with all the Tenant Protection Act issues, and then also to comply with the overlay of all these other uh, eviction moratorium requirements and conditions. Yeah. So we hope that we're covering them all. And that's, that's part of the process that I hope to be achieving when clients are calling. You know, where's the property located? Is it a covered property? How long has the tenant been there? All those issues, plus the overlay of delays. Yeah. It's and, you know, knowing the um, the landscape, the, um, the atmosphere in which landlords are, how they're being treated by the courts, and by our le elected officials, uh, I would say it's it's very important that you as a landlord understand what the rules are for your property and your tenant and their reasoning, because you don't want to make that mistake. I, I would hate to see you just throw out a three-day notice, uh, whatever, uh, and, and do something that later was found to be not allowed. Uh, the courts may not go as easy on that as we would hope. So don't throw yourself to the mercy of the courts on that and, um, and take the time to look and see what the rules are 
uh, for your property and your tenant. Now, that said, we've talked a lot about can you give a three-day notice, can you not give a three-day notice. I, I will tell you my opinion, and you tell me what you think, Gary. I personally um, don't know that it's worth the time and effort to go figure out if I can serve a notice and where the tenant is and all these reasons, knowing that I might make an error, and two, knowing that even if I do give the three-day notice and the tenant hasn't paid due to a code-related issue, I can't do anything about it anyway. So in effect, this notice really doesn't have much teeth. I'm probably going to get a lot farther. You know what I did? We had, I think last week we had 40 or 50 tenants that hadn't paid. We got on the phone and had nice conversation with them, and all but 10 have paid or, or almost completely paid. Um, you're catching more flies with honey right now than vinegar. That's my thought. So, And I, I'm going to keep doing that practice. Uh, I'm not going to be thinking nice of bad. It's yeah. not a bad thought. It's It's got to be an individualized choice on a case-by-case -case basis for yeah. each landlord. Yeah. Um, as we talked about earlier, I have a client with a lot of clients, but one in particular with lots of units. And when I had that conversation with him about send a letter, have a communication, mm -hmm. have your staff make the phone calls, his comment was, if I don't give the three-day notice to pay rent or quit, nothing is going to work because people are going to ignore me. They're not going to pay. Not everybody has COVID-19 related issues. It's true. So his position was, Gary, I'm going to give, for when first available, the three-day notice to pay rent or quit. Gary, okay. when the lawsuit is about to be filed, uh, I want, I'll be getting you to do the complaints, even though the Judicial Council deals with the summons issuance at a later date. Um, that's his decision and that's his yeah. choice. Point and, taken. Point taken. You know? Yeah, I understand. I see that um, Steve has posted, uh, one of our listeners, my office manager, has posted a link um, to the our website for the COVID-19 updates, our free forms, that sort of thing. Go there. Uh, it's CaliforniaLandlord.org, which takes you to the Rental Owners Association. Lots and lots of resources. You should... Um, you should definitely sign up there for notices and bulletins so you find out when we're having future webinars. There's a couple of um, new rules uh, that are being discussed down at the state capitol, which if passed are going to cause Gary and I to probably get together with a bottle of something <laughs> and, uh, and try to figure it out because it's, uh, it's changing all the time. And... Um, <clears throat> And, and so we appreciate you, Gary. I really appreciate you joining me and helping clear. I know I've learned a lot today. I'm sure the listeners have. Uh, one person is asking, can we make deals with the tenant where I take money from the deposit? Well, um, I, don't, I, don't like the, I don't like the idea of an advance under civil code section 1950.5, uh, working a deal where you're going to take money from the deposit, apply it differently than what is authorized by that code section. That could be... Um, considered inappropriate. There's also the possibility, we haven't even talked about it here, of negotiating and bargaining and talking with the tenant to work out not just an installment payment plan, but an agreement, let's call it cash for keys. We're all familiar with that right. from the mortgage crisis that occurred so many years ago, right. um, where you basically bargain with the tenant to vacate and pay them money if they want money to have right. them vacate. Um, right. We've done a number of those in the meantime, notwithstanding all these eviction uh, moratoriums and orders. Uh, yeah. That's a possibility, but we have to craft that properly. And we have to also deal with the issue of the security deposit as well. And that's usually done in a written agreement and so forth. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I agree with Jan. Um, where is it she wrote here? Uh, it, Jan, you said something nice. She did. It said something about be safe, call Gary. <laughs> and I agree. That's why you're here, Gary. So, um, okay. So you've got the information, folks. 447-8101 is Gary's number. 447-8101. Contact him uh, at GaryLink at TeamLink.com. 
uh, to set up an appointment to speak with him for about your particular situation. Remember, what we've talked about here isn't legal advice. It's just a, a, a discussion about all the ordinances, the uh, rules that have been passed, the executive orders, and there will certainly be more to come as we work our way through this next couple of weeks, hopefully not months. Thanks again, Gary. I appreciate it. And thank you thank all you for being it. here. And I'm going to click off now. And if you have questions uh, down the road, you know who to contact and how to do that. All right. Take care, all. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks again so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.